Hello, and welcome to Common Approach to Assessment and Management in a Shelter, Module 4B, Cardiac, Pulmonary, and Neuroassessment and Management. I am Dr. Jennifer Winters, and along with Dr. Maria Cho are the authors of these modules. Upon completing these modules, the learner will be able to, one, describe the components of a general survey, and two, approaches, general specific and subjective objective, to list and explain each component of the common subjective approach of OPQRSTAU. Three, list and explain each component of the common objective approach of ABCDE. Four, demonstrate the techniques of a physical or objective exam. Five, apply the common approaches to a patient assessment. And six, differentiate assessment findings that require referral out or EMS. In module 4A, we looked at general overview of assessment. In this module, we will specifically look at assessment of the cardiac, pulmonary, and neurosystems and managing some common events that arise with these systems. We will begin with the cardiac system. Utilizing our common approach, general to specific, we will inquire about history and meds and then move to subjective, OPQRSTAU, which will of course guide us in focusing our objective exam where we would employ the three techniques of examination. As with every exam, you'll always begin with inspection. So for cardiac, think in terms of the ABCDE that we talked about in the first module. And again, with an emphasis on ABC, airway, breathing, and circulation. So beginning with inspection, one of the first things that we see in somebody is certainly skin. So notice, are they diaphoretic? Are they sweaty? And then noticing their coloring, um, pallor. And that's, again, pallor also, you know, another name for pale, which is reduced circulation of blood, which could indicate shock, hemorrhage, anemia. And the best place to assess for pallor is uh, the conjunctiva of the eye as the picture demonstrates. Usually lots of blood vessels can be seen with a nice pink appearance. With pallor, however, that is not present. The other thing regarding coloring that you might see is cyanosis. And cyanosis is just a bluish tinge. And this indicates reduced circulation of oxygenated blood. And the best place where you can see this is in fingernails, as in the picture. They have a bluish tinge to them. Also, sometimes around the lips, you can see a bluish tinge around the lips. The other thing that might stand out to you as you look at the person um, is JVD, or jugular venous distension. And jugular veins will engorge with blood, um, indicating oftentimes heart failure. So blood just backs up into the jugular vein because the heart isn't pumping efficiently. Generally, this is assessed by having someone sort of lie flat with the head of the bed at about a 30 degree angle. However, someone sitting at even at a higher angle, for example, somebody sitting in a chair or even standing up, depending on how bad the failure is, it can be quite noticeable in the area of the jugular vein. And then lastly, think in terms of, of how somebody is breathing. Are they short of breath? Um, is it shortness of breath with exertion, so you just saw them sort of move around to get short of breath and it eases when they sit down and rest, or are they short of breath even when they're resting? Sometimes noticing how someone speaks um, or converses uh, can indicate some dyspnea. So people who are dyspneic might have difficulty speaking. So every other word, they might have to stop and take a breath before continuing. Next, we come palpation, and that's assessment of the pulses. This picture shows all of the pulse points in the body. However, the main pulse points for our purpose would be the radial, found on the inside of the, of the wrist at the base of the thumb, and the pedal pulse found on top of the foot lateral to the extensor tendon. 
Lower extremity edema can be assessed by palpating the anterior aspect of the shin. If you push on the front of the shin and your finger leaves an indentation, this indicates edema. How bad the edema is, is measured generally by how deep your finger can go and the indentation left when you remove your finger. Usually lower extremity edema indicates a failing heart. Not always. Somebody could just have sort of, you know, dependent edema where their feet have been down or dangling for a long period of time and putting their feet up uh, would take care of that problem necessarily. So again, you would have to look for other things going on as well or in addition to the edema. Lastly, you will want to listen to the heart with your stethoscope. The picture indicates placement. You usually begin with the diaphragm of your stethoscope on the right sternal border at the second intercostal space, and then move across the sternum to the left sternal border to the second intercostal space, and then down into about the fourth intercostal space, still at the left sternal border, and then you move sort of slightly over to the mid-clavicular line, again, as indicated in the picture, the fifth intercostal space. And so you listen to each one of these four areas. As each one of these areas corresponds to a specific closure of the valves of the heart, thus the characteristic sound of the lub dub or sound one, sound two, S1, S2. As you are listening, it is important to distinguish S1 and S2, the normal heart sounds. S1 is correspondent to the closure of the tricuspid and mitral valve, again, as the picture indicates, and S2 is correspondent to the closure of the aortic and pulmonic valves. Extra heart sounds, such as S3 and X4, um, are considered abnormal and generally are vibratory sounds of blood hitting an enlarged and stiffened ventricle, such as in long standing hypertension or an increased blood volume, um, which is often seen in heart failure. So when we want to distinguish between S1 and S2 and S3, S4, when we hear a whole lot of sounds when we're listening to the heart, S3 uh, um, comes immediately after S2. So it would be a sound such as lub dub dub. And S4 comes immediately after S2. So you would hear sort of a lub lub dub, lub lub dub. So again, S3 immediately after S2 and S4 immediately prior to S1. Murmurs are simply turbulent blood flow through incompetent valves. And it sounds like a swishing sound. So for example, lub swish dub, lub swish dub. Um, and you will also be listening for arrhythmias. Anything that is not a regular rhythm. You can also pick this up when palpating um, the pulses. So again, anything that's not a regular rhythm is irregular. But keep in mind that there are two kinds of irregular heart, heart, uh, heartbeat. So you can get a regularly irregular. And so this is actually an irregular heartbeat that's consistent. So for example, you might hear beat, 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 or beat, 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 beep, 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 and it sort of continues just like that. So it's irregular, but it's very consistent in its irregularity. And then you can have an irregular, ir irregularly irregular, say that fast three times, um, heartbeat as well. And this is when it's just all over the map. There's no consistency to it at all. So arrhythmias, and we'll talk a little bit more about them in a minute. So some of the, um, you know, now that we've discussed the assessment of the cardiac system, let's look at some cardiac events that can arise and when it might be important to call 911. Some of the most common and or life-threatening is, of course, an MI or heart attack, a new onset arrhythmia, and a hypertensive crisis. This slide indicates the signs and symptoms of an MI. 
Now, usually an MI, people will present with chest pain and it's generally uh, described as sort of crushing in the area of the substernal area. Sometimes tightness, people oftentimes will describe it as an elephant standing on my chest as a very common language around someone having an MI. Um, and it also radiates. So frequently it sort of is in that chest area where people are sort of pointing to the, you know, that substernal area there, but also saying that it is sort of radiating up into their back, their neck, their jaw, maybe their shoulder and down their arm. And this is one of these reasons why it's important important to ask, you know, point to where it hurts and does it radiate anywhere? Because oftentimes it's hard to distinguish someone having an MI from maybe uh, heartburn or something that may be pulmonary in nature. So one of the very distinguishing features of an MI is sort of this radiation. There's not just this one single point of pain. Um, and so that's very much a distinction with an MI. Also keep in mind, that not all people experiencing MIs do experience pain. Um, the other things that you could see is shortness of breath. Um, they may be dizzy. They may uh, also have fainted or lose consciousness. So the blood pressure could drop. Sometimes you see nausea, vomiting, um, weakness, diaphoresis. Um, you might have the heart rate go up. Um, so again, all of these kinds of things that could be going on with an MI. So after, you know, once you've decided that perhaps what they're experiencing is an MI and after calling 911, um, if the patient um, has nitro, you can give nitroglycerin if you have not already. And if available, you can administer some O2, usually about two liters. You may not have oxygen available. If you have aspirin available, you might put an aspirin under the tongue, or if they're capable of doing so, having them chew, chew the aspirin. Uh, now make sure they're not allergic to aspirin. People often ask, well, should it be a baby aspirin, a regular aspirin? It doesn't really matter in this situation. Anything from a baby aspirin up to a regular tablet of aspirin if it's available. And then morphine. Um, morphine is given for pain. It is unlikely in a shelter that you would have access to morphine, but again, it, if you do. So the only thing that you may have is an aspirin or some nitro, or you might not have any of these. But again, you have activated the EMS system, which is absolutely critical in this situation. Arrhythmias, and again, anything other than a normal heartbeat can be life-threatening, especially if it is new. So in other words, something they haven't experienced before, or perhaps they have had arrhythmias in the past, but now they're experiencing symptoms. And so oftentimes what you see with arrhythmias is the heart isn't beating efficiently enough because it's not regular, is that it isn't oxygenating well enough. So you might see some chest pain. You might um, see that they're getting lightheaded or dizzy. They're not, just not getting enough blood up to the brain. They might get short of breath, again, not oxygenating. They might feel very, very tired as a result of not getting enough oxygen. You may see some diaphoresis. They may also complain of, very commonly, a fluttering sensation in the chest. And this is almost like a bird wing sort of beating inside of the chest. So again, if any of these signs and symptoms uh, somebody is experiencing, this is definitely a 911 call out, whether they've had arrhythmias in the past or new onset. So very important to get that history with arrhythmias. And then blood pressure. Blood pressure guidelines, as you're probably aware, have changed in recent years. And what we once considered to be normal or high blood pressure has greatly changed as this table indicates. In the old days, we thought textbook perfect blood pressure was 120 over 80. Now what we consider normal is it to be less than 120 over 80. We want people to be lower than 120 over 80. And we consider anything over 120 and up to 129, even if the diastolic is less than 80, we consider that to be elevated. 
what we now consider high blood pressure is anything above 130 up to 139 or diastolic 80 to 89. And this we refer to as stage one hypertension. And this is oftentimes where you see people being put on medication for hypertension. What we consider stage two now as 140 or higher systolically or diastolically 90 or higher is what we used to uh, consider sort of that line where anything above 140 over 90 would be considered hypertension. Now we consider that stage two. And so when we talk about a hypertensive crisis, it's anything higher than 180 systolically and or higher than 120 diastolically. Now, oftentimes what leads to a hypertensive crisis is people simply not taking their medications, which is why, again, going back to that initial assessment, that basic approach, that general to specific and always asking about history. Do they have a history of hypertension and meds? And do they have their meds? Uh, when was the last time they took their meds could be really, really important. And if they don't have access to the meds, if you cannot be accessed, accessed soon, then this is definitely a need to seek out emergency care so that blood pressure can be brought down. This slide has links to additional resources, especially around heart sounds and what they sound like. Next, we will move to the respiratory system, very closely related to the cardiac system. Once again, utilizing uh, our common approach, general to specific, we will inquire about history and meds and then move to subjective, OPQRSTAU, which will, of course, guide us in focusing our objective exam and where we would employ our three techniques of examination. Using our systematic approach for the exam, uh, we begin with inspection and again, always think in terms of A, B, C, D, E with the emphasis on A, B, C, airway, breathing, and circulation. So with inspection, one of the first things that stands out to us is sort of the shape of their thorax. Normally, normal um, is that our transverse, in other words, our chest side to side, is generally twice as long or big as our front to back diameter. So from side to side is twice as long as our front to back diameter. In barrel chest, that's not true. Our our, our anterior to posterior or front to back diameter begins to get larger and larger and either becomes equal to sort of that transverse or that side to side diameter or even in some cases larger than. Um, so again, this is something that really um, stands out to you. There's really nothing to be done regarding a barrel chest. It's just something, again, part of our general survey and that inspection. When you note it, you know immediately that there is some long-standing pulmonary disease. And then you look, certainly, at breathing pattern, as we talked about. Is this person short of breath, at rest, at exertion? What's going on with them? Is the shortness of breath worsening? And again, their ability to converse is a very good indicator of how bad their dyspnea is. We also look at that accessory muscle use, as we had talked about before. Um, and that can be seen in the abdomen, again, in the sides of the chest, um, nasal flaring. All of this really adds up to somebody working really hard to breathe. And then finally, we would notice the nail beds. And of course, we talked about cyanosis already and, and actually noting that in the nail beds, that lack of oxygenation, that blue tinge to the nails, okay? And sometimes you could see it around the lips as well. We also notice nail clubbing, okay? What we would call clubbing. Normal angle of the nail bed, as again indicated in this picture, is about 160 degrees. With clubbing, that angle straightens. And generally, that is indicative of, again, long-standing pulmonary disease. So again, just in that initial general survey, 
that inspection, somebody you see with a barrel chest, you know, clubbing of their fingers, um, really indication that there is longstanding pulmonary disease there. And again, this slide just shows, again, some pictures with how to assess for cyanosis in the fingernails and again, that blue tinged around the lips as we had talked about earlier. Auscultation is the last thing we would do. And this slide indicates how you would place your stethoscope on the chest to listen to lung sounds, both anteriorly and posteriorly. Anteriorly, we start around the clavicle and work down to about the fifth intercostal space using an over-down pattern, um, which allows us to compare one side to the other. So as you can see in this picture, it's over, down, over, down. And again, starting at the clavicle, working your way down to about the fifth intercostal space. Posteriorly, we start at about C7, again, where the picture indicates, and work our way down, again, using that over, down pattern, to about T9. In women, this generally falls just about where a bra strap might go, but that's right around T9. Please note that it is really important to listen posteriorly, as this is where the lower lobes are auscultated. You cannot assess lower lobes of the lungs anteriorly. You have to listen from the back. And again, why this is really important is because it is the lower lobes where most pneumonias occur. So if you only listen anteriorly, you could miss something really important. Now, at the end of this section is a slide with links to breast sounds so that you can sort of practice uh, listening and distinguishing normal from abnormal breast sounds. But generally, there are three types of abnormal breast sounds this slide indicates. There's crackles, and that's kind of a snap, crackling, pop sound. That can also be mimicked by if you took sort of a, some hair and sort of rubbed it in between your fingers right in front of your ears. That's what crackles sound like. And this generally indicates a bronchitis or pneumonia, um, maybe some heart failure. So this is really, again, fluid sort of in those lower lung fields. And again, these are mostly heard posteriorly um, in the lower lobes. Wheezing is really an obstruction of an airway, and it's generally an inflammation that causes the wheezing. It's kind of a high-pitched musical sound. And, and this we often hear in asthma. Sometimes we hear it in COPD, but this is very indicative of asthma. And somebody really, uh, if you hear wheezing, uh, is, is really experiencing an asthma attack at that moment. And then we have what we call ronchi, and these are sonorous sounds. These are really sort of harsh, uh, kinds of, of almost like a snoring sound. And these are heard generally in the larger airways, whereas crackles are in, in much smaller airways in the lower lobes. Ronchi are heard in the larger airways, and it's fluid, lots of fluid build up in the larger airways. And again, chronic bronchitis is, is oftentimes something that you'll see, you'll hear ronchi. Now that we've discussed assessment of the respiratory system, let's look at some respiratory events that can arise and when it might be important to call 911. Generally speaking, cause for serious concern with the respiratory system includes inadequate oxygenation or difficulty breathing, and that often is indicated uh, with um, O2 saturation rates, oftentimes either low or seen dropping despite um, administering oxygen. Now, you may not have ox um, access to testing someone's O2 sats or oxygen in the shelter where you are. Um, it can often also be seen with confusion, again, not getting oxygen to the brain. You can, um, you know, severe dyspnea is also a concern. Um, people unable to catch their breath, especially if you are beginning to see signs of confusion, um, cyanosis, and again, unrelieved by oxygen. And then anybody with a fever and coughing 
um, especially with you know, severe dyspnea or confusion or O2 sats dropping. Now, certainly if you're able to, you would want to administer oxygen. Um, if there's somebody who has longstanding pulmonary disease, they might have inhalers or even nebulizer treatments. Um, however, again, you may not have access to that. And again, just to review signs of inadequate breathing, um, you know, again, the use of accessory muscles in the chest, the abdomen, sometimes seen in the neck area, nasal flaring, the cyanosis, fingernails around the lips, um, people cleaning their hands and feet, uh, coughing, um, again, listening to lung sounds and hearing wheezing or the crackles or the ronchi. Um, any kind of impaired mentation, as we talked about, you know, dizziness, restlessness, anxiety, oftentimes restlessness and anxiety can be a real indicator of someone who isn't oxygenating well. And then you might see people using pursed lipped breathing. Again, these are people with longstanding pulmonary disease have, have learned how to do this to really help their breathing. So again, any of these things going on and you do not have access to oxygen, uh, there's no access to nebulizer treatments or even inhalers. Uh, this is definitely an emergency and needs to be uh, 911 uh, pretty quickly. This slide has links to additional resources for listening to lung sounds uh, and using inhalers and nebulizers and administering O2 just in case you have access to those resources. Next, we will move to the neurosystem. Once again, utilizing our common approach, general to specific, we will inquire about history and meds and then move to subjective, O-P-Q-R-S-T-A-U, which will, of course, guide us in focusing our objective exam where we would employ our techniques of examination. Neuro is a is a huge system and for our purposes we will mainly focus on level of consciousness or mentation movement coordination and we will review a couple of special exams that might be helpful to you in a shelter beginning with level of consciousness or mentation um, this is probably one of the most critical areas to assess as it um, as changes in either level of consciousness or mentation is usually the first sign of a changing or deteriorating condition. So is this person awake, alert, oriented to person, place, time, and event? And again, think back to that general survey. And has it changed? Well, this morning they were, and now they aren't. Or perhaps you didn't see this person earlier, or this is the first time you're meeting them, but somebody accompanying this person or who knows this person may say to you, you know, this isn't how they normally are. That's a big red flag, right? Next is movement and coordination. Again, is there change? Um, and also thinking in terms of a history of falls, especially recent. And if they do, you always want to know if they hit their head or lost consciousness. Really important. And then finally, of course, the use of assistive devices. Often lost or left behind and can mean the difference between someone being mobile and safe and someone not being mobile or being unsafe. So really important uh, to assess their use of assistive devices. All right, so let's take a look at the management of neuro events and when 911 may be appropriate. So again, the big ones that we need to be aware of are the signs and symptoms of a stroke, signs and symptoms of a concussion or a traumatic brain injury, and then dealing certainly with a seizure. Now someone may have Again, a seizure disorder, long-standing seizure disorder, and again, going back to uh, you know, that overview and that important general to specific assessment about asking about history of disease and medications. Also, seizures can have secondary causes, which can be drug and alcohol withdrawal, um, and again, for a stroke. So recent fall, someone hit their head or some kind of other injury, we can also see seizures with electrolyte imbalances, um, infection, 
tumors, and even fevers that go really high. So let's start with stroke. Um, how to tell if someone is having a stroke, we can use the mnemonic be fast, be fast. So think in terms of balance. Does the person have a sudden loss of balance? Um, has the person lost vision in one or both eyes? Does the person's face look uneven. Again, that general survey. Is one arm weak or numb? And oftentimes we can de determine this by having people sort of stretch out both arms. If one arm is weak, they might not be able to actually lift up one arm, or if they can get both arms straight out, the weaker limb will begin to sort of fade away, fall away uh, from the body. They aren't able to hold it up. And then, of course, we look at speech. Is it slurred? Are they having difficulty speaking? Um, and sometimes we just ask them to repeat a phrase. Um, and a couple of phrases that are common uh, are light, tight, dynamite, or the sky is blue. Um, so again, having them repeat something if you're not sure and if they're unable to do it, that it can be a danger sign. And so if any of these things are going on, and again, change from where they were, um, it's time to call 911. So stroke. And then, of course, the concussion or head injury signs or symptoms. So important, did they take a fall? Were they injured in some way? Hit their head? Lose consciousness? And oftentimes, these are signs and symptoms that don't always show up uh, immediately or right away. So it's always a good to continue to monitor people. So you often will see a dizziness or headaches. Um, people will have a sensitivity to like noise sometimes, memory problems, uh, difficulty concentrating, um, fatigue, um, unable to sleep, um, those kinds of things. So again, Putting sort of a picture together, general to specific, you know, have they had an injury? Did they hit their head? Beginning to monitor for these kinds of things, or this is one of the complaints that they're having. And if they have fallen recently or had an injury, particularly a head injury, then this is definitely a, a, a considered an emergency. And then finally, seizures. Seizures do not always require emergency medical attention or a 911 call. However, you will need to call 911 if any of the phone had a seizure before, you know, something is obviously going on and it needs to be evaluated. Um, or if the person has difficulty breathing or waking after the seizure. So people may have a history of seizure disorder, but with this particular seizure, they're having difficulty with breathing or you can't wake them up. Um, or if the seizure lasts longer than five minutes. So if you're there and witnessing somebody have a seizure, you know, you might you know, immediately look at the time so you can time it or yell out for somebody to time it. Or if you weren't there to ask somebody, can you guesstimate how long the seizure lasted? Also, if somebody has another seizure pretty quickly after the first one, again, indicative of somebody who needs a 911 call out in further evaluation. Obviously, if someone was hurt during the seizure or has a health condition like diabetes, heart disease, definitely would be a 911 call. Um, so again, and all the other seizure precautions that if you happen to be present while someone is having them, you know not to restrain them, but protect their head um, and keep them safe during the seizure. These two next two slides detail special exams for cognition. Uh, the first one is a mini cog, which is a gross test to alert you that someone may have or be experiencing cognitive deficits. And that's just a three object recall test for memory. That's saying to someone, I'm going to give you the name of three objects. I want you to repeat them back to me now and then remember them because I'm going to ask you to repeat them back to me later. And then having them draw a clock. Now, probably this is not something that you're going to do in a shelter. However, what I recommend is the serial three. This is 
three object recall. And research has shown that this is a very effective way of assessing someone's cognition and or alert you to any changes. So again, um, you know, for example, they were able to, you know, recall three items this morning or yesterday, but now that they cannot do that. So again, what we call the serial three, it's a very quick assessment to just alert you that something is going on cognitively with someone. And then the confusion assessment method or CAM is specifically for determining if someone is experiencing delirium a condition that older adults are especially prone to developing. And it focuses on four features. Feature one, delirium has to have an acute onset. This is how we dis distinguish it from other cognitive issues such as dementia. It is an acute onset and it can happen really within a matter of hours or even minutes sometimes so you know three hours ago they were fine and now they're not or you might see a fluctuating course so one moment they're really really confused and then the next moment they clear somewhat and then sort of go back into this confused state Feature two is inattention, and this is an inability to focus. And oftentimes we assess this by asking somebody to count backwards by 20 if you feel like they could do that. Um, because counting backwards, you have to really pay attention. You have to focus. And then there's feature three, which is disorganized thinking. I mean, thinking is just kind of all over the map and doesn't make any sense at all. And then feature four, an altered level of consciousness. So one moment they might be absolutely hyperactive and they, they can't get them to settle down. And then the next minute you can barely arouse them. So to actually state that there is a probable delirium going on, you have to have feature one and two. It has to be an acute onset. There has to be an attention. And then either three or four either three or four, delirium. Also, please keep in mind that delirium is considered a medical emergency and that it indicates that something is going on and it really does need immediate attention and evaluation. This slide um, contains links to further explanation and examples of performing uh, the mini cog and the CAM assessments. Um, if you are in uh, areas where you are older adults, I highly recommend viewing uh, these two uh, resources. They're excellent and I think will be a great benefit uh, to you. So again, thank you very much for your time.